ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. Today it's my conversation with Geraldine Brooks. Geraldine is an Australian-born journalist who became an international foreign correspondent who then reinvented herself as a best-selling, Pulitzer Prize-winning historical novelist. Her books are sold all over the world. And historical novelists will often look for a single artefact, a key that will open a door to the world of the past. And in the case of Geraldine's most recent novel, the artefact was a skeleton of a horse, a skeleton of a horse that was locked away in the attic of a museum in Washington, D.C. And not just any horse. As one of her characters says, this is the horse. Lexington was the fastest thoroughbred of his time, which was the middle of the 19th century, just before the American Civil War, which is when part of Geraldine's novel is set, when dark clouds are looming over America. Geraldine's novel is called Horse. Hi, Geraldine. G'day. G'day. Nice to hear you say that too. I see. I still read, you've been in, living in the United States for some years now, but I still hear real affection for Australia in your novels. It's still there, isn't it? Absolutely. You know, I love this country and I, it, it really gave me everything. And, and I think all of my novels might be set in various places in the world, but I think that the heart of them is an Australian heart. There's a picture of you on your website standing in front of a horse. Who is this horse? Tell me about this horse. That's, uh, that's my pony, Valentine. Um, for my 60th birthday, I got the little girl's dream. It only took a while. <laughs> I, I started riding when I was 53. Oh, that's, which I, that's I, a big step, isn't it? I mean, you could get thrown and all of that, couldn't you? You can, and mm-hmm. I did. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, I just, uh, I became horse crazy um, at 53. And um, I don't recommend it. I think it's much better to start when you're five or even earlier when you fall off and you bounce. But anyway, it happened and uh, I was in a place where it was possible to have a horse. And uh, unfortunately, you know, they're, they're kind of expensive and also they're when you get horse crazy, you get obsessed with them. And so I wasn't getting any actual writing done on the project at hand. And so it was really lucky when I happened upon this story of Lexington because I was able to combine my working life and my newfound obsession before the red ink overtook the family finances. <laughs> There's a moment when you talk about your character, Jarrett, who, who, and a woman, they, they, they take some comfort in leaning into the warm mass of the horse. Ah, oh, it's just the best thing. Just the best thing. I don't know what that's like. I'm, I'm not a horsey person and never, yeah. <laughs> never had a pony and uh, never asked for one either for that matter. What, why is there comfort in that? They're incredibly sensitive animals. You know, I've always loved animals. It's always been all about dogs for me. Um, but I think humans and dogs look out at the world in the same way. Our eyes are looking straight ahead because we're predators and we're looking, you know, uh, for our next meal. Whereas for a horse, their eyes are looking all around, you know, um, 180 degrees because they're looking for the thing that's coming to make them the next meal. So if you can have a relationship with a horse and cross that interspecies barrier... It's very powerful if you earn their trust. And when they reciprocate affection, um, just talking about it now, I'm thinking about my mare and how if I go out to her in the paddock and she's warmed by the sun and she'll lean back against me and I'll lean against her and it just slows down everything. It slows your breathing down. It's just, you know, it's, I was never very good in yoga. I was always lying in savasana thinking of all the things I could be doing if I wasn't lying in savasana. And, um, so you need a horse to lean on you to get some mindfulness then, do you? <laughs> Is that what you need? <laughs> yeah, I mean, and it's true when you're on a horse, you know, it's be here now or be on the ground really soon thereafter. So you really have to just focus on that and be in that moment. Your novel's called Horse. It's not called Lexington. Why is it called Horse instead of Lexington? When I heard about this um, skeleton, uh, it was uh, just over 
over a lunch by chance, and it was a, a gentleman from the Smithsonian Institution in Washington who had just delivered this skeleton to the International Museum of the Horse in Kentucky. And he was telling the story about how this celebrated horse, who was a, an absolute celebrity in his day, you know, presidents and um, General Custer and all these historical figures would come to look at this horse and pay tribute to this horse. But the skeleton had passed out of fashion, you know, the Smithsonian's more about science now than it is about cabinet of curiosities. And had been just used as an example of Equus Cabalus, labelled horse and stuck in the Hall of Mammals for many It years. didn't have Lexington on, 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 as, as, as its name on the case? That wasn't the purpose of it being there. It was just oh. there. It did originally, but then the story of the horse as an individual, famous racehorse, became less important in the science of what does a horse look like compared to a rabbit skeleton, compared to a rat skeleton. Gee, don't you think, though, when you see that, come on, science... Come on, spark up a bit. Put the name Lexington on it. It's got a story. There's the story and the science. They're not mutually exclusive. That's why it's down in the International Museum of the Horse now. It's got a whole room to itself with paintings (laughs) and story of, you know, the the significance of this horse went beyond the racetrack to the breeding of thoroughbreds because this horse sired more champions than any other horse. Looking at the photo of the skeleton of Lexington, I don't think I'd ever seen a a horse skeleton before. He looks like a dinosaur. It looks amazing. Could you look at that kind of thing forever? I, I think I could. It's just I fascinating. Find, I find bones fascinating. Yeah. I mean, you know, I I collect them <laughs> and I try and figure out what the what the creature was when it was alive, you know, I walk when I'm walking in the woods or the bush or on the beach. And, uh, and you know, back in the Sydney suburbs, I got a fruit bat that had been electrocuted and Loved that thing. <laughs> what do you mean that thing? Do you mean what? The it's skeleton. The skeleton itself, yes, right. Yeah. yeah, the way the wings unfolded like an accordion bellows and mm. the way fruit bats have little hands, you know, at, at the end of their wings that they've got the same bones that we have, only lighter. Tiny, tiny, tiny bones? Tiny, yeah. So they're quite delicate, you know, yeah. these little hands at the end of the, the bat wings. Yeah. Lexington, as I said, is no not just a horse, it's seen as the horse. Why is its history so so powerful? What's the, the thing that made it so extraordinary? Uh, first of all, the thrill around the races, uh, they were very different to the way we do horse racing now. We think a mile and a quarter is a long race. They used to race for four miles oh. three times in the one day. It was heats. So it was a real test of the speed, strength and endurance as well as the courage and the character of the horse and the tactics of the jockeys. It was a much more interesting sort of a, a deal. <laughs> and it was taking place in a culture where the horse was a much more familiar creature to, to humans in those, those days too. Absolutely. Everybody, you know, it was an agrarian society, so everybody knew horses, had horses, loved to race their own horses. Um, it was a national obsession in the United States. Uh, 30, 40,000 people would turn up at the track. Uh, it was a very big deal. Just like here with Farlap and, and the, like in the early days of the Melbourne Cup. Sure. So, so what was it made that made Lexington particularly extraordinary, like, like in terms of Lexington's ability to run and win these extraordinarily wrong, long races by Re- our Record-breaking speeds. For, that was the first thing. The horse was so fast, they, they invented the mass-produced stopwatch so that people could clock the, the times. But... After the racing career, it was the incredible success of this horse as a stud sire and the number of champions that he fathered that cemented his place. Can it be said that he enjoyed racing or does no horse enjoy racing? This horse, I think you can say probably did because even when he was racing uh, without any horse anywhere near him because he was so much faster than they were, so he had no pacemaker and he would just, continue to sprint, you know. He just seemed to really want to go. As I said, he was his skeleton was mounted and put into a case after he died. You write in your novel, it's just a side thing, that even today, like scientists today, you have them using beetles to clean the flesh from the bones of animal skeletons. Can that possibly be true? It is so extraordinary. So... The Smithsonian Institution is called the Attic of America, Uh, but 
The Attic's Attic is this enormous establishment called Museum Support Centre, and it's out in the Wash- in the Maryland suburbs, uh, a long way from anywhere the normal punter goes to see museums. And in this place, which goes for literally miles of labs and storage pods, they have every kind of modern scientific research going on, the best equipment, um, the most high-tech stuff, but you go to the osteo prep lab and there's the bug room. The bug uh, room? <laughs> yeah, in the bug room. <laughs> they call it the environmental suite, but everybody refers to it as the bug room. Domestic beetles because they can clean bones without damaging the underlying tissue and they've never found a better way to do it. I just imagine there'd be a big jar of bone cleaning fluid or something like that, but no, it's kind that of would, lovely. That would destroy information. Ah. That's the thing. Going back to the major thread of the novel, the major strand of the novel, which takes place in the 1850s, there's his groom. It's a story of his groom who's introduced by the name of Warfield's Jarrett. That's a very interesting name. How does he get a name like Warfield's Jarrett, this groom? So as I started to uh, explore this story, which I thought was about a horse... I realised that it was about a lot more than that because the entire thoroughbred industry was built on the skills and expertise of black horsemen, most of whom were enslaved or formerly enslaved. And Lexington had a black groom named Jarrett who had been enslaved um, for most of his life until the Emancipation Proclamation. And... uh, and so I tried to find out about the real Jarrett, but there wasn't anything on the historical record beyond a name and uh, the, rec- the records uh, at the farm when it showed when he started to be paid and how much he earned. I couldn't find out anything about what it was like to be him. So that's where the novelist's imagination comes into play. So Warfield's Jarrett, that's his owner? That was the first, yeah. It's, it's just hard to cough out the word owner in in context of a human being, but this is, you know, a book that looks at the reality of enslavement and what a brutal system it was. Um, And the the horsemen had an unusual position within it because what they did was so valuable to these thoroughbred owners and so much prestige and wealth flowed from this that these guys actually were able to exercise a little bit more uh, agency over their own lives than other enslaved people. But even so, they could be ripped away from their families at any moment. And In your book, I just was mentioning then the whole idea of leaning into the huge mass of a horse, the warmth of that. It seems that the presence of a horse around two people from different social standings seems to be able, has the possibility at least of humanising both of them and sort of pulling them away from their ideas of what their social standing might be and maybe offer the opportunity to make people uh, offer a different kind of an intimacy. Is that the case, do you think? I think also there's a respect for the expertise. If somebody is a better horseman than you are, um, you can't help but want to learn from them. So it does upend the usual structures quite a bit. Yeah, in fact, the portrait artist you've got there gets a bit wrong-footed, actually. It's kind of fun to watch him get wrong-footed because he doesn't know as much about horses as Warfield's Jarrett does. Yeah, I mean, he did know quite a bit about their anatomy. This is a real painter. He uh, he was an itinerant painter who travelled around and painted the portrait of Lexington many times in the course of the horse's career. But he... um, he does defer, and and you 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 get this too. This is from the research that I did, and you you're reading the letters that are passed between the thoroughbred owners, and uh, and they really do defer to the black horsemen and and the skills that these men had, you know. And this is, and then you realise that they're plundering these skills. This labour is being stolen. There's another strand in your novel, which is set in 2019. And the character there is a woman, young woman, a young Australian woman called Jess, who grew up on Burwood Road in Croydon and who... Concord. Ex- Concord, I beg your pardon, sorry, who accidentally ends up having a life in the United States. That's you, isn't it? Is that you, Geraldine? I'm Jeremy? afraid so, yes. And she's just as weird and awkward as I am. So, yes, I decided I'd give myself one character I didn't have to research. <laughs> what was Ashfield like 
and Concord like when you were growing up, that whole part of oh, Western look, Sydney? I had, a, I had a dream childhood because our, our parents were fantastic. My mother particularly just was full of imagination and she gave me the greatest gift that you can get, which is time. So she always had time to make up games and our little our little um, fenced backyard was like a universe. So I had an incredibly great childhood there. How would she use her imagination to entertain you? She would, you know, we had all these different games that we would play, shop, you know, so we'd take the offcuts from the vegetable peelings and I would wrap them up and she would buy them and then we had hat shop with the camphor laurel leaves and, you know, we'd, she would she would play. She, she had been a radio actress and so she could do different voices and, and, you know, she loved books as well. So we were always, she was always putting me onto great books and reading. My father also loved books and would read at night when he would come home from work. So so unlike these days when kids can amuse themselves with Xboxes and iPads and what have you, you just vet, you had vegetables for toys, <laughs> did you? Is that what you had? <laughs> that is exactly right. <laughs> Everything, you know, a stick. Stick. <laughs> luxury. <laughs> right, it's luxury. And there was a good stick over there. That was the good stick. So what was your domain in the house? Did you have your own little places around that house? That little I had a pretty, I had a pretty dingy dark bedroom on the wrong side of the house, but I lived in the yard. You know, so the front yard was my mum's flower garden and it was just wonderful, full of roses and all kinds of English flowers because that was what we did in those days. <laughs> and then the backyard, I thought it was huge and there was a swing and there was a great big willow tree that you could climb and an apricot tree. And I've never tasted apricots since then that are anything like those warm off the tree, juicy spilling down the front of you. Gorgeous. Your parents sent you to be educated at one of the most subversive institutions in Australia at the time, which was a convent school. So many Australian feminists came out of those convent schools. Is that you? Was that your 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 education? Yeah, particularly in my high school, Bethlehem. At the time I was there, we had a very radical uh, head nun. She was terrific. She had gone off to uh, work in Harlem and uh, got caught up in the civil rights movement and came back and full of, you know, wonderful revolutionary ideas. And of course, the church male hierarchy came in and put their boot on the whole thing. And But our minds had been opened by then and there was no going back. It was really quite fantastic. And the teachers there were exceptionally good. So what, the church came in and pulled these nuns out, did they? And put well, them, no, or... they, didn't have to pull, they didn't have to pull them out because they're all leaving in droves. Right. And so you got more, uh, did you get a, a more conservative um, education after that? They tried. They tried. And it how was, did you respond to that? We were very rebellious. How were you rebellious, Geraldine? Oh, we just, we weren't buying it, you know. So they came in and told us, you know, it was back into the, you know, you had to wear your blazer over your jumper because boys would see the shape of your breasts and we'd go, bullshit. So you took off your blazer. I was imagining you were like smoking or something, or wearing makeup, or uh, uh, or drinking out of little little uh, little no, flagons or something we, like that. No, we didn't. No, uh, there wasn't a lot of drug abuse. But I tell you what, we used to hike up that lilac uniform to ridiculous <laughs> heights. And uh, so, were you seriously told you must wear a blazer, otherwise boys will see the shape of your breasts? Exactly. <laughs> We all thought that was hilarious, you know, and this poor, this poor sister, I mean, she tried, but she wasn't working. And none of us would go and see the Pope when he came and we all got read the riot act. Why aren't any of you going to see the Pope? (laughs) (laughs) Interestingly too, it it seems you became interested in Judaism as, as a teenage uh, young woman. I was, I was very interested in the history of the Jews. I just got obsessed with the Holocaust. Why? Why is that? It's the the Holocaust is like such a signal event in human history. It's hard not to become. A, I was it. I had an obsessive personality, so it would be you know. Was it the vast antiquity of Jewish history too? Like the fact that it no, goes just, back thousands, no, ten thousand years. Or it was just the uh, the whipsaw of suffering. So you go from, you know, King David got it all together briefly, and then it all falls apart, and they're in exile, and. You know, and then the pogroms in Russia and, you know, the Inquisition in Spain. It's just the suffering, I guess, um, and, and the drama of it. And then you get up to the Nazis and I was ma- I was writing plays about the Warsaw Ghetto and making my poor Lithuanian immigrant friends play the Nazis. <laughs> did, you, did you sort of kind of present... Your identification with Jewishness in any kind of visible way? Oh, yes. I was wearing a Star of David with my school uniform. 
Right. Was that controversial? Uh, no, the these nuns were just like, explore, do your intellectual explorations all you want. And they were really good at, um, you know, you'd, you'd make your rant and then they would make their points and it was, a, it was, a, it was encouraged to be curious. What do you think about this fascination years later when you converted to Judaism after you married? Well, your you know, so it it kind of had waned by then. <laughs> but um, then I found that I was going to marry a man named Horowitz, and I knew enough about Judaism to know that the religion is passed through the mother, and I wasn't going to be the end of the line for a lineage that had survived pogrom and Shoah, and so. When we decided to get married, it just seemed like a very obvious thing to do. Was it just the tradition or the faith as well? Oh, look, I'm not religious in that way. I'm I'm probably an atheist. Uh, yeah, I'm an atheist, but I'm I'm interested in the search. I'm interested in the human need to explain the inexplicable fact of our own death. And the struggle that's gone on to do that. And so when you go to the little shul that I attend, um, we try and take that old text and those poor old Hebrews windswept in the desert, trying, struggling to make sense of it. And we take the old text and we turn it in the light of our own lived experiences and try and squeeze some juice out of it and see if there, you know, are any answers. I haven't found any yet. So after you left school, you became a cadet uh, and a journalist and interested in exploring some of the greater reaches of the wilderness of human experience, which included the newsroom of the Sydney Morning Herald. This is the 70s, isn't it? 79. 79, huh? Uh, How blokey was the SMH? No, there were some fantastic women journalists who, you know, really blazed trails, um, but there were very blokey enclaves of it. Mm Mm-hmm. A fair bit of bum pinching went on in those days. Well, I, w- I was assigned my first job in journalism was the sports department. So yes, had to had to master a sideways scuttle to avoid the uh, gropers. <laughs> so you were assigned to the race courses, and was that just the, the gallopers, or was it the, the trots and the dish lickers as well? The whole thing, absolutely. Right, and did you have any expertise in that? Was that no. was that even required? No, it was. It wasn't. I wasn't reporting anything. I was there to support the racing reporters, which meant taking the details, and there were a lot of them. So you had to. You had a card for every horse in every race in Sydney, which is a lot of nags. I can tell you. And I had to say everything about that horse on any given race, where it was at the turn, where it was at the finish, weights, odds. Um, And I had to get it all at speed. And then the worst thing was at the trots. After you'd been at the gallops all day long, you went off to the trots and I had to call in all these details to a copy taker over the phone in between the races. So it was really stressful because I'm not very good with numbers. (laughs) (laughs) It was like a different Australia in those days, wasn't it? The racing was a much bigger thing than it is today. What was yeah. it like being in that atmosphere of, of people hanging around the, the tracks, betting heavily, living from race to race? To be honest, my head was so down working the whole time. And 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 I was also somewhat traumatised because if you go to every race, you're going to see some accidents. And they're very, very traumatic for the animals. And, you know, to me... As an animal lover, seeing these beautiful creatures, you know, um, dying in that way was very hard. So I didn't really, I was like a horse with blinkers on. I would go there, I would do my work and I would leave, you know. So the escape for for you down the track was to get a scholarship to Columbia University. Oh, before that, I did manage to get sprung out of (laughs) Yeah, I'm sort of fast forwarding here a bit. Yeah. Uh, No, I, I I went to that that paradise of the young reporter, the features department. So. And then I got a scholarship, uh, Greg Shackleton Memorial Scholarship, uh, named for the wonderful foreign correspondent who was killed in uh, East Timor. And this was at the university's, Columbia University School of Journalism in 1983. How did you meet Tony Horowitz? Your Tony was a be? fellow student. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, uh, we 
we both decided that we separately that we were going to bring down capitalism. So yes. we thought we'd study business reporting in order to do that. From the inside. <laughs> right. Dismantle <laughs> so, it from the inside. Okay. He had he had been a union organizer with uh, black woodcutters in Mississippi and realized that that was going to be a very slow way to affect social change. So he'd come to Colombia from that direction. And um, What did you like about him? Was it his mind that, or was he beautiful too? Well, it was his politics probably first, but his incredibly beautiful muscly tanned forearms had something to do with it. What is it with muscly tanned forearms? That's a thing, isn't it? Isn't that a thing? <laughs> Certainly a thing for me. <laughs> <laughs> so did he get those like from reporting out in the sticks, did he? Um, he... He had gone back in spring break to Mississippi to make a little film about the woodcutters that he'd worked with. So, yeah, and he came back to New York where most of us were pretty pasty still because the uh, spring comes slowly and he was really tanned. Was it hard to flirt with him or easy? <laughs> no, no, it was very easy to flirt with him. Right. Yeah. So, it was, so it was a thing really quickly then, the two of you. How did you know things had turned serious with you? Uh, I don't know, but we were married within a year and a half. So, you know, it wasn't, wasn't a long courtship. Yeah, you got married somewhere in the south of France. It's, we did. My yeah. sister had a beautiful house there and I'd gone there with her when I was only 19 and just fallen in love with this perched village uh, in the Alp Maritime. And so it seemed like a great idea and then it turned out to be quite complicated, actually. How so? <laughs> oh, well, you, you're not supposed to get married in France unless you're French, so we had to wrangle that. And then trying to get a rabbi who'd marry a recent reform convert to an actual Jew was really also quite tricky, but we pulled it off. Podcast. Broadcast. This is Conversations with Charlie King. So we were speaking before about you, your fabulous career as a journalist. You went off to the Middle East or West Asia, as it's called these days, I think, as a correspondent for the Wall Street Journal, reporting from the Middle East. This was uh, at a kind of volatile time, because it's always a volatile time. It's always a volatile time, yeah. And this was, you were reporting on the, the funeral of the Ayatollah Khomeini in Iran in 1989. What do you remember of that day? Where were you watching that from, Geraldine? So, you know, you get the call in the middle of the night and it's the foreign desk and it's, Khomeini's finally kicked it, get up and go to Tehran. Right. Okay. <laughs> and so, you know, uh, we flew to Tehran, all the journalists assembled and then they, you know, they knocked on the doors, you know, like you'd, five minutes later and get up and in the bus and then off to um, uh, the airport where they put us in these old, Huey helicopters. And we're flying over the city of Tehran, which is a big city, and you look down and every street and avenue is just crowded with black-clad mourners converging on this cemetery at the south of the city. Had anyone put a number on that crowd? Well, you know, there were some very senior reporters there and they look, you know, they're like, how many? Mill, two mil, three mil, big? Mm. Biggest. And so we believe that we may have been witnessing the biggest crowd of humans in history, probably. And it was really, it was extraordinary. So they, they landed us and, you know, I'm in a chador because you had to be. And, um, and they sort of shepherded us to the front, but I'm behind all these tall black clad Iranian mourners who are beating themselves on the chest and it was incredibly hot and, you know, so the the blood and the sweat from this is flying everywhere and it's so, such an intense scene and then the helicopter carrying Khomeini's coffin comes in and tries to land and the mourners are so intense they're grabbing at the skids of the helicopter and as they bring out the coffin they get it and it tips up and you see like I didn't see it because I was behind all this. I think I've seen news footage. I think I've seen like his feet popped out. Yeah, no, it was, it was, and then, so the helicopter takes off and they put 
out shipping containers around the grave to, you know, contain the site and finally get him in the ground. And I didn't know what had happened till I went back to the hotel and watched it on TV. So it just to me, it was an example of how you can be a witness to history and not see a thing. Your job, I suppose, as the Wall Street Journalist's correspondent is trying to explain that to your readers. Why why a figure like that who was regarded as, as a monstrous figure in the United States, someone who instituted laws for women that were like worse than medieval in many ways, um, why a figure like that could provoke such intense scenes of, of mourning? Were you able to do it, do you think? And could you uh, figure it out yourself? The, you know, a lot of it was to do with the the foreign policy mistakes that the great powers have made in Iran over the years and continue to make, in my opinion. But, you know, that this country had been kicked around by the British, kicked around by the Americans. Uh, and Khomeini just gave them all the finger. And even people who hated him appreciated that. And also he was the rare uncorrupted leader. He lived incredibly frugally and he never... Um, profited, you know, he, he believed what he believed. I think his worst crime was sending all those little boys to their deaths thinking they were going straight to heaven. You mean the minesweepers in the... Yeah, the yeah, it was, it was like um, uh, Gettysburg, you know, just kids walking into cannon fire. But, you know, it was, it was Saddam Hussein who started that war. It wasn't Khomeini. And it was Saddam Hussein who was bombing the civilian areas in Tehran. And the United States was abetting that, so no wonder there's bad, bad blood, literally, between the two countries. You went actually to his house to interview his his wife, who hadn't been much of a public public figure in the in Iran uh, up until his death. Yeah. What did they want? What did she and her, and her daughter want you to know about him? They wanted us. They wanted me to know what he was to them. And it was an it was an extraordinary afternoon, really, sitting in their courtyard having a cup of tea and, and pomegranate seeds, and these three women were sitting there: his daughter, uh, his daughter in law, and, and his wife, and they were just talking about what a great husband and father he was. How you know he had uncharacteristically, you know, got up in the night to feed the babies when they were little. And I told one of my Iranian friends, this an Iranian feminist friend, when I got back, and she said, oh, he got up to feed the babies. What did he feed them to? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, he was, he was a complicated, much more complicated, I think, than uh, we came to grips with. He used to write really good poetry, Persian poetry, which is something that's much admired. Um, and uh, and his wife was very influential. People in the regime knew to go to her if they wanted to get anything done, even though her name was never mentioned in public. And yet for all that, he's the kind of man who had novelists murdered and uh, uh, gay people we killed. Wanted and, to. Um, Thank God yeah. Salman's going to die of an extreme old age, I hope. Yeah. Uh, no, he was... Uh, but the complicated thing about Iran is it was a nightmare and a disaster for the women who had thrived in a more secular society. But for the women of the conservative countryside, which is the vast majority, he did something that the Taliban will never do, which is he made it possible for women to get educated because their families felt safe to send them to school in an Islamically run system. I met this young medical student in the city of Avaz once and she said, you keep banging on about the chador. You think I care about a piece of cloth when without this piece of cloth, I would never have been allowed to come to university to learn to be a doctor. And because I'm here away from my family, I've met the man I'm going to marry and I'll be the first woman in my family ever to marry for love. And this is you who wanted to take your blazer off. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, what did you make of all that? Well, I made of it that we, we're we very arrogant Westerners. We think we know everything, but there's always a lot more to know. And also, as a reporter, I learned that the best entry into understanding the region was through women. They have their own caricatured ideas about the West too, though, don't they? Oh, they're all so sorry for me. Why they were they sorry like, for you? They they let on as how they thought I must have nobody in my family who loved me because they're letting me travel around the world unprotected like this. I think one of the things I find many foreign correspondents have in common is there's a feeling amongst them, this is pure supposition on my part, Geraldine, but they want to see the dark heart of the world and see if they can stand it. And was that you? And I'm asking you this because I know you went into Iraq 
at the end of the first Gulf War, after Saddam Hussein had uh, performed a terrible, uh, a terrible crime against humanity against the Kurdish people. Well, this was region. before, actually. This was in the uh, the brief interregnum when the Kurds, for the first time, had the boot of Saddam lifted off their neck. And so in this week that I travelled across Kurdistan after the Gulf War, they were able to tell their own history and they were able to go back to Halabcha where Saddam had used poison gas against them and actually retrieved the bodies of their loved ones. So I went with them to excavate the mass grave that they hadn't been allowed to visit. I went with them to... Uh, the immediate aftermath of having freed prisoners from the dungeons of Saddam's absolutely brutal torture regime and to their sort of impromptu conferences where they were actually sharing their stories with each other for the first time. So it was very exhilarating. And then, of course, America made the fundamental terrible mistake of letting Saddam have the use of his helicopter gunships. And the next thing you know, I was on the run with about a million Kurds and we were just trying to get across the border. We went towards Turkey and many people went towards Iran, but it was just a flood, like a biblical exodus from Kurdistan under fire. Absolutely terrifying. And I lost a colleague in the chaos and he was killed by the Iraqi troops that came in and just brutalised everybody. Maybe it's a bit of a long bow to draw, but I wonder if there's a connection between that and your decision to become a novelist. I mean, apart from the creative pleasure it affords you, but, I mean, you try and find out why the world is the way the world is and maybe sometimes you can't find answers in journalism and you might find better answers in fiction. What do you think? That's not why. (laughs) It's a very banal reason I made the switch. It's because I wanted to have a baby And I didn't think that the life that I'd been living for a decade at that point was compatible for me uh, with the kind of childhood I wanted my kids to have. And yet there's so much catastrophe and historical catastrophe in your books. I know that's because it's it's always interesting to write about this. No, no, I wouldn't be able to write the novels if I hadn't had the 10 years of seeing the extremity of human experience. I mean, I'm still feeding off the experience I had as a journalist. And I loved every step I took. Uh, not, I mean, I didn't love the brutality, but there was, there was an intense sense of purpose in exposing the consequences of Western foreign policy in the lives of ordinary people. And I felt it was really worthy work and I was really proud to do it. And, you know, if I hadn't been about to turn 40 and realise that I had forgot to get pregnant, I'd probably still be doing it. <laughs> Your first novel, uh, Year of Wonders, taken from the true story of, of a village in England, that quarantined itself, that made a decision to quarantine itself to prevent the plague, the Black Death, travelling any further beyond its borders. That's a fascinating conceit. A research for that. Is that most of the pleasure or much of the pleasure of it? I do love the research. The journalist in me loves the research. Trying to find out what really happened as far as you can, following the line of fact until it gets too faint to follow any further and then having the freedom, which you don't have as a journalist, to make it up. (laughs) Your uh, years later, you did deep research again for your historical novel, The Secret Chord, about King David. Now, he's in the Torah, or the Old Testament, if you like, Where else could you go for information about him? I mean, it's not even really 100% certain that he was a a genuine historical um, figure, is it? It's true. There's not a lot of evidence, you know. So I believe he was because, as uh, as a historian pointed out, who who would make up such a flawed figure as a national hero? (laughs) So I do believe he existed, but... um, it was, it was tough and I would never go back beyond the written record again. That was an experiment I'm not eager to repeat. Um, How did you try and acquaint yourself with life in that time? So I decided that the only way to, I mean, there's the archaeological evidence, so that's interesting to see. You know, you, you read in, in uh, the Tanakh, as the Jews call it, or, or, or the Old Testament, um, that he lived in a palace and you're thinking, oh, you know, second Iron Age, what kind of a palace would that be? And then you go and look at the archaeology and it was a palace. Oh, there's palaces, yeah. yeah <laughs> it was yeah. it was nice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, then it's more about, well, what was it 
like to be him and how can I how can I get in touch with that so what did he do T- turns out herding sheep is it seems like is a great uh, entry level job for future li- leaders of the Israelites because they almost all start out as shepherds. So I'm thinking, well, what do you learn as a shepherd that could be useful? And so we went to herd sheep, my then 10-year-old son and I, in the Shephala, uh, the foothills between uh, the coast and and, uh, Jerusalem. And are they still herding sheep much as they would have five, six thousand years ago? Yes, they are. And uh, and it was quite interesting. So it was a mixed herd. It was sheep and goats. And the real shepherd said, now I want you to see if you can separate the sheep from the goats, <laughs> which is something that had only existed as a metaphor to me. Um, <laughs> but it turned out to be quite tricky and we couldn't really get it done. And then my 10-year-old had the insight and because he had observed that when you put pressure on the sheep, they cluster together for safety and they put their necks over each other's backs so that the predator could only get one of them. Whereas the goats who are more sure-footed, they just scatter to the four winds. So that was how you separate them. What's the work like? Is it pleasurable or frustrating and infuriating? No, I liked it. I like, you know, I like hanging out with animals and I kind of got the feeling of what it would be like to be out there on a hot afternoon and just looking after this flock and all the thoughts that would spool through your head. But the, but the lesson is, you know, to lead, you have to understand those that you're leading and you have to care about them and you have to care for all of them. And I think that's why it's a really good entry-level job for did, leaders. Did you have a uh, staff like Moses or a bit more of a Bo Peep crook? It was, it was, a, it was a staffy-looking thing. <laughs> <laughs> and being out there in the open, was it a bit, was it a bit Australian in some ways? It's a t- it's different. I mean, the trees are very different and the, the sort of fragrance that comes off the land is very different. There's something about the Australian bush that that incredible aroma, that, the essential oils in, in our... Eucalyptus. Yeah, mm. and not just that. All the, the, all the plants have an incredibly vivid smell. It's very, to me, home. The, different bird song too, yeah. Bird song, absolutely, yeah. They're, they're a bit... That, you know, except during the migration, they're a bit short of birds out there in Israel. <laughs> and the day, for someone who's a, a journalist who's used to having a pretty hyperactive day, trying to pack in too much into 24 hours, was it much slower? And did you like that if it slowed down? Well, it would have been slow, but we had a lot to we had a lot to get done. But yeah, no, the sheep herding day was really that was nice. And then the other day that was, I thought, quite telling was when uh, you know David when he was. He had a period when he was on the run from King Saul and he was an outlaw and he was uh, in uh, Ein Gedi, which is on the Dead Sea, and it's very rocky and steep around there. And so um, I, and I thought it would be a good chance to take my son to Masada. So we scrambled up to Masada and my 10-year-old is way ahead of me and I'm like hot and sweating and struggling to keep up. And I thought this must be how King Saul felt chasing after David. <laughs> When you came to Australia together with with Tony, how did Tony like it here? Was he comfortable? He here? liked it too much here. You know, he said this is this is the most wonderful place to live, but I don't, I can't work here because there's not enough bad stuff happening. <laughs> he, 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 yeah, I, this is a, a massive simplification, but he said there's no squalor. <laughs> did you have any inkling that he was unwell? He wasn't unwell. He was as fit as a flea. He was at the gym six days a week. He didn't have, you know, a gram of spare body fat on him. And uh, he had a sudden heart attack and died the picture of health. Uh, I don't know how. I've got no idea how people get over that. I mean, I don't. Do you? Did you? uh, You don't get over it. No, you don't get over it. I still, there's still a part of my mind that, expects him to come, you know, because he was on book tour when this happened. And I still expect him to come through the door and throw his dirty laundry on the floor and tell me some hilarious tale from the road, you know. How do you like to remember him like that, the kind of guy who did Uh, that? The humour, you know. So we're very lucky, the boys and I, because all the memories of him generally end with a big laugh because he was really, he was the funniest guy and he was the most open-hearted and good-humoured person and he was curious about absolutely everybody and he would run towards the people most of us shy away from. And so there's so much 
to be grateful for in the time that we have. And so that's our practice is to embrace radical gratitude for what we had. Yeah, is that was was that the advice you got no. after? Well, did you get much useful advice after he died? No, I don't think anyone mm. really knows what to say. And the only thing I've learned is whatever you just accept what people bring. And how yeah. do you practice radical gratitude? What's the best way of doing that? Do you just put- try and live in the good memories, really. And uh, and luckily we've got his books, which my older son pointed out are the distillation of the best of him because he worked so hard on those books. And um, they just epitomise all his best qualities and some of them are just eye-wateringly funny. So whenever we're getting a bit sad, we pull out one of the books and I think one of our favourite um pieces is when he uh, hitched a ride on a lobster boat off Western Australia and with the most profane crew you have ever s- met and got radically seasick. Like anyway. champion swearers on a, on, on a lobster boat. <laughs> and and really, really <laughs> off-colour jokes and they're telling off-colour jokes as he's, you know, dying of seasickness. Anyway, it's very funny and so, you know, it never gets, we never get tired of rereading his work. Like I was saying, the first part of your novel, Horse, begins with it begins in 1850 in, in that part. And we know, with the benefit of hindsight, that the Civil War is coming, coming not to, in 10 years or so, mm. from the era your book is set in. There's some dark clouds there sort of looming on the horizon. During the Civil War, there was a memoir written by a woman of the South called Mary Chestnut. And afterwards, I think she wrote something like, the the reason why we went to war, she said, the North and South, was because we hated each other so. Do you see those kind of intractable hatreds in America today? I think what I see is people in silos where they don't know each other. They just hear the echo against the tin walls of their own little chambers and they mischaracterize each other. And a lot of people believe things that are absolutely not true, and yet they're impervious to being informed of the truth. And that is really scary. When you've got people who are unreachable um, with the truth, with evidence to back it up, I don't know how you run a politics like that, where people can lie without consequence. So you have your family. You've also got a horse too. I've got a horse and a dog. (laughs) It's been amazing speaking with you, Geraldine. Thank you so much. Lovely, Richard. Thank you. Geraldine Brooks's novel is called Horse. been listening to a podcast of conversations with Richard Feidler. For more conversations interviews, please go to the website abc.net.au/conversations. <laughs> <laughs>